But I'll miss some point. Glad y'all came out on this Sunday. Beautiful fall weather. We're happy to have Mickey Lovett here today. He'll be uh, bringing a message. If y'all will stand, we'd like to raise the <laughs>
today is going to be Ephesians 2:13 through 22. He himself, Christ Jesus, is our peace. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has never made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body, through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through him, both have access to one spirit, to the Father. So when you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, and him you also being built together into its dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So much. I uh, want to. Is it working? It went back off. Ah, let's try it again. Now? Awesome. Okay, I'll try not to touch that button again. I <laughs> uh, want to say uh, thank you to Doug Campbell and to Mission Point for asking me to be here today. And uh, y'all probably heard a report from Doug. I heard Janice is still improving. Uh, Doug doesn't have any symptoms yet, and hopefully uh, we're all going to be clear and free from this COVID sooner or later. It's kind of interesting that we're right in the middle of a pandemic. And what does that mean? It means everybody in the world is sharing something together, and that's the threat of a disease that is attacking humanity. So our lesson today, we're actually going to talk about what God has to say about the other big issue that's facing us today, and that is uh, social unrest. We got some social unrest going on. And at the heart of that is a problem that we call racism, but I think at the heart of that problem of racism is understanding what God actually has to say about race. So I am a biblical counselor. Uh, my wife, Dixie, some of y'all may know her, Dixie Lovett. Uh, we've got three daughters. Uh, the oldest one lives here in uh, Murfreesboro with our son-in-law and two of the grandkids. We've got two other daughters over in North Carolina that are married to Marines. And we've got uh, six grandkids over there, plus one on the way. So daughter number two has four of the grandkids, and she's the one that's got the extra one on the way. So we're really excited about that. But um, So let's look at our... And I'm going to use this as a takeaway. This is the design of this. Once I started studying and preparing for the sermon, I'm like, there's no way you can preach all this in one day. But I thought I could give everybody a takeaway that they can go and look at these scriptures themselves. So I'm going to encourage you not only to participate in hearing the word today, but in going home and reading this on your own later on and pondering some of these scriptures. As a biblical counselor, that's something we always do is try to get people you know, from one session to the next session, what really matters the most is not the sessions, it's what happens between the sessions. So hopefully I can introduce some ideas here to you today that might be helpful later. So what does God have to say about race? And do Christians follow the cultural definition of race or God's definition? So if you're on page one of the handout, you'll see this in the left-hand column. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That word God is plural. It's Elohim. It's the plural form of the word God. And we know that when we talk about God, that there's a unity in the plurality. 
Elohim is plural. It's repeated 26 times in uh, Genesis chapter 1. The Lord, Yahweh, our God, the Lord is one. So Jesus tells us this, and he's quoting Deuteronomy 6 when he says it over there in Mark chapter 12. But we know that Yahweh is the name of God. And that includes God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We know this from Matthew 28. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, as Jesus says. So there's uh, unity in the Trinity. There's diversity in the tri-unity of God. So if we stop and think about God, He is one God, but He is one God in three persons, and those three persons are in a perfect unity with each other. So if we're reading in uh, Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 25, it says, And God saw that it was good. So God saw that halfway through day 6, it was good, but there was something going on there. And uh, God said, let us, there's the plural pronoun that goes with the plural God. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Skip down to verse 27. So God created man, or mankind, in His own image. In the image of God, He created Him. Male and female, He created them. So immediately with the creation of humanity, there's something that's paralleling this unity that we see in God. He's producing some diversity in the plurality of humans. Male and female. <clears throat> and then He tells them in verse 28, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So, we've done pretty well with the multiplication thing. I checked yesterday, there's 7.8 billion people on the planet. And in spite of COVID, you can look at that little clock where it shows the numbers, and they're going up, not down. So the pandemic is causing everybody to take notice of problems that we share together as humans, but it's also, I think, causing us to take notice of the God who created us. So. God has a purpose in all that. And I'm sure with a name like Mission Point, y'all are all about doing mission for God. So this is um, it's good. So God's given us an opportunity here with the pandemic that maybe He's calling people to Him. So I'm going to skip through parts of this pretty quickly because you have the notes to take home. So let's go over to... He talks... Uh, a little bit extra about what happened on day 6 when we go to Genesis chapter 2. And in verse 18, at the top of the left-hand side of your page there, on page 1, he says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God put him to sleep, and then he pulls a rib out, and uh, so that rib he fashioned into woman. So now we've got that diversity, that plurality of humanness, and he goes on and says something about what that means. Verse 23, Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh, she shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So Adam is recognizing this unity that he has with Eve because Eve was actually taken out of him. Okay? And then verse 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Ah, so we're back to becoming one flesh again. So here's Adam. Eve comes out, and then Adam and Eve come together, and they form one flesh union. So Cain comes along, Abel comes along. We see what's happening here. So here we see diversity in gender, male and female, man and woman, Adam and Eve. <clears throat> so we know the serpent came in, and things went south. Okay, they had uh, trouble in the garden because they stopped trusting God 
and they trusted their own judgment about what Satan said, and they sinned against God. And so God uh, did something then. And he, he says this to Adam in verse 19. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife name Eve because she was the mother of all the living. So God had given Adam the responsibility of naming all the animals, and he also gave Adam the responsibility of naming his wife, and he named her Eve. So here's some points from that little section of Scripture. Here we see both the judgment of God and His grace on His humans. He says, by the sweat of your face, that's pain, you shall eat bread, that's grace. To dust you shall return, that's death. He promised them death if they ate from the tree, right? The Lord made garments of skin, that points toward atonement. So something had to die that day, and God chose animals as a substitute replacement for them on that day. And we know that uh, if we look in Genesis 5, 5, that Adam ended up living until he was 930 years old. I would certainly call that life and grace. But they did experience death right away when uh, Cain killed Abel. So God's favor toward His humans, His children, has everything to do with His grace and our faith in Christ. Okay? Now we're going to page 2, left-hand column. According to God, the human race is the only race. There's only one race according to God. And those are humans. Whoever believes in Him is joined to the family of God. So when Jesus is given the Lord's Prayer, He says, Our Father in Heaven, hallowed be Your name. So as a Christian, everybody who's in this room that is also a Christian, we are connected to each other for all of eternity because Jesus is standing between us, holding us together in a perfect unit, in a perfect uh, connection. So if I have a good fellowship with Jesus and you have a good fellowship with Jesus, then the two of us should have a good fellowship with each other. Is it always that case? Or sometimes the wars break out in houses between husbands and wives? Uh, they do, don't they? But what we have to remember then is, so how do I get back in peace with my spouse? Well, i got to be in a good fellowship with Jesus. And when my wife Dixie is also in a good fellowship with Jesus, then the two of us are going to be in a good fellowship with each other. So this is this unity that's being pointed to in the perfect unity of the Trinity. We're not perfect. But we do have the Holy Spirit living in us. And He is perfect. And He can help us be conformed more and more to the image of Christ. Okay, so... Um, what about the genealogy of Christ? Was Christ multi-ethnic in His uh, genealogy? But we can go back and read... And we know that Tamar, who played the prostitute with Judah, is in Jesus' genealogy. We know that Rahab, who was a citizen of Jericho, a Canaanite, is also in the uh, genealogy of Jesus. We know that Ruth, the Moabite, not a Jew, is in the genealogy of Jesus. Bathsheba, she was the wife of a Hittite, which probably means she was a Hittite as well. But the Bathsheba is in the genealogy of Jesus. So when we stop and think about it, from the human side, is Jesus multi-ethnic? Or what the culture today would call multiracial? He is, right? Now, I'm kind of trying to jot drop the, uh, the way the culture thinks about race and substitute my own thinking with the way God thinks about race. Okay, so how many races are there in God's economy? One. 
the human race. And Jesus is multi-ethnic. I think he's demonstrating to us what God means by this. Well, what about uh, from the divine side? When we look at Christ, He's 100% human and He's 100% God and He's the only one like that, right? So among the Trinity, He's the only one that's human. Among humans, He's the only one that's God. So let's think about His divinity for a moment. Okay? Divinity became flesh. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. So approximately 2,020 years ago, Jesus became a human being. So He's the one that united with us to form a union with humanity. And because of that union, we have the opportunity as believers in Christ to be united through the Holy Spirit because of this union He already established with humans. So we should be all about being united and being uh, united to God, but also as brothers and sisters in Christ that are united to God, realizing that we are all united to each other for all of eternity. Um, so does God's grace reach beyond the human construct of race and racial prejudice? Well, yes it does. Ephesians 4.32 says, Be kind to one another, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. So because I've been forgiven, then it's my responsibility to forgive my brothers and sisters in Christ when they sin against me. That includes my wife Dixie. And uh, I know I sin against her. Occasionally she might sin against me, but the responsibility we have there is to forgive one another and be kind. Um, so as a believer in Christ, what can I do about civil unrest? Well, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount tells us, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. So, it's our responsibility as children of God to do what God has done for us, and that's make peace with those who might be at war with us. So there's a lot of different ways to do that, but number one is to love your neighbor. So this gets repeated often in Scripture. Love your neighbor as yourself first appears in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18. Then it's in Matthew 5, 19, 22, Mark 12, Romans 13, Galatians 5, and James 2. I think God's trying to make a point here. He wants us to love our neighbor. Now, according to Jesus, in the story of the uh, Good Samaritan, the Jew in the ditch that got robbed was passed by, by a priest, a Levite, two fellow Jews, same ethnicity, and then who actually came to his aid? The Samaritan. And typically Samaritans and Jews hated each other. But this Samaritan had mercy on the Jew in the ditch. And here is the summary of that is when Jesus asked uh, who is the one that what proved to be a neighbor and the lawyer answered the question, the one who showed him mercy. Okay, so it's up to us as Christians to show mercy to our fellow human beings, no matter where they came from. Okay? And that's every Christian needs to show mercy to every other human being, no matter where they came from. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? This is a quote from Jeremiah 13, 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or can the leopard change his spots? Who made the Ethiopian to look like an Ethiopian? God did, right? Who made the leopard to look like a leopard? God did. So under God's providence, we look like we look because He made us that way. I have heart disease. Got two stents put in in the past few months. My wife had uh, uh, breast cancer. She had uh, mastectomy. She's recovering from that. But God was good in that He also directed not only the disease, but the early detection of it. So we're, we're just singing God's praises that He's helping us in our time of need. So when James says, 
Count it all joy, my brothers, when you face trials of various kinds. Does that include COVID? Does it include social unrest? Okay, so if we're going to find the joy in those things, we've got to understand God's providence. He is always providing us a way of escape. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So we're going to face trials and temptations. But we're, if we're a Christian, brothers and sisters, we're never going to be facing those alone because God is always going to be with us, helping us through the trial. Some of you understand this more than others. Okay, if you've been down the road of trials, you know what I'm talking about. And the older I get, the more I understand what God means by various trials. And they come in so many different forms. Now here's the thing. Do I know what the next trial is going to be? I don't. But who does? Our Father, who knows what we need even before we ask for it, knows what trial we're going to face next. It doesn't mean the trial will be removed, but what it does mean is He's going to be with us to take us through that. So, the Bible has uh, several other scriptures that talk about Ethiopians. So, Jeremiah also wrote, and you can go back and read this in chapters 38 and 39, what about Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian who saved the prophet Jeremiah from the sister? And the quote from there, from uh, 39 18, this is God talking about the Ethiopian that saved Jeremiah from the sister that he was placed in. Here's what God says For I will surely save you. Was the Ethiopian a Jew? He wasn't, was he? He was not. He was a foreigner. I will surely save you, and you shall not fall by the sword but you shall have your life as a prize of war because you have what? Because you have put your trust in me, declares the Lord. So this is the dividing line for, for the Lord. We're either in or we're out. There's two kinds of human. We're either trusting Him or we're not. Now there's varying degrees of how much we trust Him and I know our faith can grow, but the bottom line is, are we trusting in God for our salvation? Are we trusting in God just for our eternal home or are we trusting Him right now during the midst of COVID? Are we trusting Him right now in the middle of social unrest? You know, how can I help someone who's feeling oppressed? Love your neighbor as yourself. I mean, we can always reach out to others. That includes every one of us. Every one of us who claims the name of Christ needs to be reaching out to others who are different from us. I actually had the privilege. If you want to meet people from other countries, go to Aldi. I was in a long line and I saw a short line over here and I made I moved my line to the short line and there was a man darker than me standing there. And uh, I said, uh, hello. And he said, hello. And he had a big cart full of groceries. I only had two or three items. And he says, well, why don't you go in front of me? I said, no, it's okay. He said, no, please. So I went in front of him, and uh, so I said, like I often do, he had an accent. So I said, so where are you from? And he said, Ethiopia. I said, well, that's cool. And I always, when somebody is from a different place like that, I'll ask them, are you Christian, Muslim, Jewish, what? And he said, I'm Christian. And I said, so I'm sure you're familiar with the story of the Ethiopian unit. He said, yes, I am. So we actually agreed to be in prayer for each other as brothers in Christ. So there's an immediate connection. Here's a man from Ethiopia that I immediately knew. I could actually, you ever look at a person's face and you think by their countenance you know if they're a Christian or not? I had a feeling before I asked the question if he was a Christian that he indeed was. And he was. So his are people that meet us, are they seeing that countenance on our face? My wife gives me a hard time sometimes because sometimes I, she, it's like I'm frowning. I don't mean to be. And it's not because I'm sad. A lot of times it's just an inquisitive look on my face. But it really does help 
when we project love to others, when we see, especially when we see strangers on the street, what does it cost to give a smile? Doesn't cost anything, does it? You know, or you know, a friendly wave or anything. So we can always be encouraging one another to, to love and good works. So more about the Ethiopians. So in Acts chapter 8, 26 through 40, we read the story of Philip and the eunuch. So Philip is one of the seven that was uh, designated to be a deacon, but he also was an evangelist. So the Holy Spirit tells Philip to go to this chariot where this Ethiopian is reading from the scroll of the prophet Isaiah. And uh, so we know that the Ethiopian was a court official of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians. But why do you suppose God, the Holy Spirit, sent Philip to talk to this Ethiopian and give him the gospel? We live in a melting pot here in the Nashville Metroplex. There's people literally here from all over the world. One of the recent guys that came through, you remember class at New Vision, I do that sometimes too. He uh, had a Russian Bible in his hand. He grew up in Russia behind the Iron Curtain, but it was still there. <laughs> and, uh, but it's cool, now he's here. So, but we've got people and we've got a lot of fellow human beings who are Muslims. My cardiologist he is. And I am talking with him about Abraham. Why? Because I want him to understand the promise that came through Abraham. In fact, we're going to jump right over to that now. So I'm going to skip some stuff. Let's go down to where it says at the bottom of the, that same page on the right, it says the call of Abraham. <clears throat> Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And he who dishonors you, I will curse. And here's the, here's the special part of this promise to Abraham. He says, and in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Interesting. So Abraham is the first one that's actually called a Hebrew because he crossed over the river Euphrates. And then, so he has a son named Isaac. And interesting, God has another conversation with Isaac and he tells him in the next section down there in verse 4, in your offspring, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So we got all the families, all the nations. Then when Jacob comes along, who is Isaac's son, and also becomes named Israel later for the 12 tribes, here comes the promise again. So God says in uh, verse 14 of that Genesis 28, He says, In you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now we know that the offspring that would come from Israel would come through the tribe of Judah. David would be a precursor, but then that would ultimately be Jesus. So the offspring that would bless all of humanity and open up the floodgates for every human being to become grafted into the, the remnant of Israel to be a child of God, Jesus, he's the one that would be the uh, the one that would fulfill this these prophecies, these promises that were made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In Psalm 22, so Jesus quotes that one from the cross, and he says, "My God, my God, why have you forsaken me?" Jesus knew exactly why God forsook him. God placed our sin on him on the cross so that our sin could be taken away and then He put His righteousness on us. It was imputed to us. Our sin to Him, His righteousness to us. If we go on in Psalm... Plus, I think Jesus wants us to go back and read closely Psalm 22. Uh, the Guess Who quotes it in one of their psalms from back in the, in the 70s. But anyway, that's irrelevant. Let me move on here. So here is verse 27 and 28. 
All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. Who? All the ends of the earth. And all the families of the nations shall do what? Worship before you. Okay, so the Holy Spirit is prophesying what would happen on the cross, but also what would happen because of the cross. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and He rules over the nations. That's all the nations. So, if we go into the New Testament, then we're going to find a lot more stuff that ties. Here's what happens. So, the story of Jesus really begins in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it really doesn't end until the New Jerusalem. So we know that the story of Jesus is developing over time. Abraham, the Scripture tells us in the New Testament, it says Abraham, and he's quoting the Old Testament, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. So if we go to Hebrews chapter 11, we know that all those Old Testament saints that are listed there, including Abraham, are saved by the blood of Jesus just like we are. Because they had faith in Yahweh, by the thought they had faith in Jesus, therefore the blood of Jesus cleanses them from all unrighteousness too. Now, so when we start talking about the people of God, in the beginning there were only two, right? Actually, there was only one. Then there was two. So God has had this plan of where we are right now in 2020. 7.8 billion human beings. How many of them are coming to Christ or have come to Christ? Not enough, right? There's plenty of time left that we can get the word out. That's what Mission, Points is all, what Mission Point is all about. I'm sure that's what you do. So... So here's a couple of points. In Luke, it tells us about the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. So was Nazareth known as being a great Jewish city? No, right, it wasn't. So um, there's a reason that uh, Jesus grew up in Nazareth. It was to fulfill the Scripture. And I think God is also making a point here that He's no respecter of persons. All human beings are His human beings. And all who place faith in Christ are His children. Children of God. And who does God want to be His children? All of His human beings. And what's our responsibility in that? To go and deliver the good news. To be kind to one another. To do the things that we need to do as Christians to reach out to those who might be saved but aren't yet. Okay? Um, so there's a lot of prophecies that are fulfilled and we don't have time to cover all those. But again, please take your homework home and read the rest of this stuff. <clears throat> it's kind of interesting. One of my cardiologists is also from uh, Cana of Galilee. And he happens to be a Christian. So the one that actually put the stents in for me is a Christian from Cana of Galilee. Now where was Jesus' first miracle? Not in Judea, you know, the prime time for Jews, but in Galilee, which is more the area for Syrophoenicians and those that were came at least from a mixed heritage of Canaanite and Jew. So I don't think it's at all by accident that God picked it to be that way. Um, so it goes on and on about how Jesus is coming to reach out to all the families of the world. The Gentiles are definitely in that. If it weren't for... for uh, is anybody here from a Jewish family? 
originally. So by blood, nobody in here is from a Jewish family. So how is it that we're in the family of God now? It's because we've been grafted in by faith, by God's grace and faith in Christ. We've been grafted in. What time do we start singing? I should have asked that question. When you're done. Okay. <laughs> we started at 10 minutes after, right? We're not watching that that Okay. Well, if... Okay, so I'm, my goal is to be finished with the sermon by straight up 11 o'clock. Is that okay? And then we got time to sing. All right. We work these things out. It's a negotiation. Um, so over in Luke chapter 11, Jesus is talking here. He says, For as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, were the, Ninev were the Ninevites Jews? They were Assyrians, right? Are some of those Assyrians going to be in heaven? Well, let's keep reading. As Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so will the Son of Man be to this generation. The Queen of the South, talking about the Queen of Sheba, who probably came from Ethiopia, the Queen of the South will rise up at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon and behold something greater than Solomon is here the men of Nineveh Jesus says the men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it for they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold something greater than Jonah is here so the way people become in God's family is all the same way. It's by grace through faith in Christ. This is where, this is what happened. They're go, we're going to see some, some of those Assyrians that Jonah preached to in heaven. Why? Because of grace and faith in Yahweh. We're going to see them there. Um, so in Luke 17... Jesus heals the ten lepers. And uh, it says this, Now one of them, when he saw that he was healed, one of them, out of the ten, turned back, praising God with a loud voice, and he fell on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. Now he was a Samaritan. Then Jesus answered, Were not ten cleansed? Where are the nine? Was no one found to return and give praise to God except this foreigner? And he said to him, Rise and go your way. Your faith has made you well. So God does not exclude, Jesus being God does not exclude any human being from coming into the fold if they will place their faith and trust in Him. And that's a beautiful thing. Um, and it, there's just several more scriptures that go on and on about the same thing here. Let's skip down to uh, Matthew 25. Before Him will be gathered all the nations. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him will be gathered how many nations? All the nations. And he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right hand but the goats on the left hand. Will that be based on ethnicity? Not at all. Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty. You gave me drink. I was a stranger. You welcomed me. I was naked. You played me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king 
Jesus will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. So does God want us to be helping our brothers? Yeah. Galatians 6 1. He wants us to bear one another's burden, bear one another's burdens. He wants us, those who are spiritual, who are indwelled by the Holy Spirit, he wants us to, if a, if a, if a brother leaves the flock, he wants us to go and bring the brother back. I mean, there's so many things that tell us that we need to be proactive in this whole thing about a racial or a social um, upheaval that's going on in the world around us. He wants us to be, as Christians, all Christians, He wants all Christians to be reaching out to people who are different from us with the good news of Jesus Christ. If I meet a man on the street and he's already a Christian and I bring up Jesus, have I wasted my time? Scripture tells us, stir one another up to love and good works. So I just encourage the brother. Um, one of my brothers yesterday from seminary, Lowell, called me. Lowell is one of my favorite seminary friends we went went through together. Lowell is uh, in Mississippi what they would call a black man who pastors a Southern Baptist church full of mostly black brothers and sisters. But there is no brother that I have that I'm closer to than Joel. We call each other on a regular basis. We pray with each other. He does mission trips to Uganda. Or Uganda, I'm mispronouncing it. Uganda. He is, uh, he is a faithful, blessed brother of mine that I love dearly. I don't have a, a blood brother, but I got something deeper than that. And we all do. Every brother or sister in Christ will be our brother and sister in Christ for all of eternity. God wants us to be at peace with one another. And that's what the Scripture today was all about in Ephesians uh, 2.13. I'm going to read through that again. This is going to be like my closing prayer. But now... And here's the, here's the remedy for the wars we're in. And that includes wars within, wars with others, wars with God. The remedy is one remedy. Jesus Christ. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near. How? By the blood of Christ. For He Himself is our peace who has made us both one, there's the unity, and broken down in His flesh the dividing wall of hostility. And there's a dividing wall of hostility that needs breaking down now. How? By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that He might create in Himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile, reconcile, that's another word for peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And He came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through Him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And that household is what? Built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus Himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In Him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So, in conclusion, takeaway points. Union with Christ, being in Christ, produces peace. Unity in Christ produces peace in families. Unity in Christ produces peace in churches. Unity in Christ produces peace among, among churches. Unity in Christ produces peace in communities. 
Unity in Christ produces peace at work. Unity in Christ models the love of God. Elohim, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Unity. Unity in Christ attracts people to whom? To Christ. So if we love one another, brothers and sisters, the world will know that we are His disciples. Christ Himself is our peace. So it goes on, and there's more and more scriptures in, in the post-conclusion notes, and that goes into the book of Revelation. Uh, so let me uh, say this. If there's anybody here who is not at peace with God, and you want to make peace today, please come forward. If God is calling you to peace with Him, please come forward, and we will uh, pray. If you've got any questions about anything, that was brought up that you want or something you want to pray about please come forward and do that there's a couple of uh, I guess elders or deacons that are going to come up here and be here as well to greet you yeah. so I'm, I'm just visiting I don't have any authority here so Doug asked me to preach so and I know Kirk so that's all authority I need well actually not so we all need Jesus as authority right so let's pray Dear Father, we do thank You so much for loving us through what Jesus has done. We know that He's the great missionary, the great peacemaker, the great reconciler uh, to, to You, between us and You. We're reconciled because of what He did. And we know that You have called us to have the ministry of reconciliation. So we need to be out there doing everything we can to be making peace with others based on the blood of Christ. So help us reach out, help us lift up Christ, help people be drawn to, to Christ because they see the beauty of, um, of what He has done for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
thank you everybody for being here. Uh, a prayer morning this morning and last Sunday, man, it was raining a lot, wasn't it? Uh, Nikki, thank you for filling the pulpit this morning. Thank you for the very informative and uh, much needed message in this time that we're in right now. Uh, I want us to close out the prayer and uh, of course, uh, do be remembering. If you don't know, uh, Doug and Janice. Janice was exposed to COVID. Uh, she does have the, the virus. Um, so far right now, Doug has no symptoms. They're following all CDC and health department guidelines. And uh, uh, he has been tested, but his test didn't come back yet. But he has no symptoms whatsoever. Uh, also, uh, as far as contract contact tracing, there's nothing to do here with the church because the last time they was at church here was August 30th. So they were their exposure came well after their last time that they was even in the building. So uh, I want to let you know that. But do be praying for them as they navigate through this. She is doing better. And uh, I'll be praying for the rest of the family too because I guess they were in South Carolina. And, uh, a family event, I guess, when the exposure occurred. So, uh, uh, be praying from them a call or, or a, uh, even a, a meal wouldn't be a bad idea. So, uh, just be thinking of them during this time. Kyle, good to see you back. And, uh, back I'm glad you're are you feeling better. A little bit. Well, we're still praying for you. Uh, me praying for Missy, Johnny, Samantha, and Nana. They're all on a family trip, aren't they, John? Yes. Pray for their travel. Mercy and safety, they brought back to us here safely. Uh, a friend of the Myers named Steve, he is, uh, he's improving. He has gone through COVID and just, he's getting a lot better, but just don't want to, the long-term effects. Uh, far as his breathing, of course, I think he had pneumonia with that also, in the wanting to heal up from that long term. But he is doing much better. Um, be remembering Kath this morning. Her hip has been bothering her for a while, and uh, every time the weather changes, she gets some kind of sinus. So uh, she just wanted to kind of take it easy this morning. So be praying for her. She has no kind of fever or anything like that. Just a, uh, well, like I said, you get out there and do too much. And I think the doctor says she got a bone spur, so uh, the Lord just needs to heal that. Uh, so be praying for her. And uh, also be remembering for Dina's friend, I believe you said, the, uh, the young mom that uh, uh, lost twins. Uh, be still remembering that family. Is there anybody else, if I forgot anybody, that we do need to pray for this morning? Now let's go to the Lord in the word of prayer. <clears throat> Lord, we come to you this morning thanking you for the God you are. And Lord, uh, Lord, you uh, truly, I don't believe you see skin color. We all bleed red when we cut. And Lord, uh, the enemy, the devil, would like to see nothing else but a house divided. Because your word says a house divided won't stand. And if we come against each other, our black brothers and sisters, our Asian whatever the case, Lord, or uh, Native American, if we get to warring with each other, the cause of Christ cannot go forward. The enemy would want that to happen. So in the name of Jesus Christ, let's all of us pray that we stand against the devil, the root of all this, father of lies, Father of division. And then lift up, he says, if Christ be lifted up, he'd draw all men into to him for salvation. 
for unity, for brotherhood, sisterhood, the brothers and sisters in Christ because of what He's done on the cross. And Lord, I thank You for that. Lord, I lift up all the ones we've mentioned for prayer requests this morning. Lord, Doug and Janice, Lord, I pray healing for that family. And Lord, I lift up any ones that have it, Lord, that the symptoms be mild and I'm glad Janice has improved it, Lord. Uh, she did have it for a few days there pretty rough. Lord, we thank you that you brought her through that. Lord, uh, missing Johnny and all the math and now, Lord, give them travel mercies and protection, Lord, while they're out for their health. Lord, that Steve's friends will continue for improving in the healing for him and uh, that there be no long term health consequences for this from this coat. Lord, I pray that you help Kath feel better healed more than uh, uh, sinus Lord she might be experiencing Lord, I just ask you to take care of that. Lord, then his young friend Lord and her mom had lost those twins Lord, I pray that you be with that whole family Lord, continue we remember them. Thank you, Lord. Kyle's back with us. Prepare that family, Lord. As, uh, he prepares for a, a longer deployment. And Lord, uh, Rebecca, Lord, is, she's uh, going to be delivering another little one. And Lord, I pray that you just uh, be with her during this time, Lord. And uh, Lord, uh, just help her through this and, uh, with minimum, Lord. Uh, morning sickness or anything that Lord uh, comes with that when we pray that the little one be healthy and Lord we just lift that family up to you also Lord with all this we just give you praise honor and glory and thanks for who you are in our life and for your blessed son Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord for it is in the name of Jesus we pray Amen